I don't know if they can send the, uh... <laughs> what? Oh, um, if because it's not pointing here, let's see. I don't know. I'd like it to be like an announcement about a Paradox party or something, maybe after the party. Yeah. I want it to be a big in the main room. I remember you. So are there money activities or just hanging out? Just hanging out. After hearing about Rich is taking people walking around Berkeley um, and taking people into our rock climbing and I hosted it for you guys would like to add to the list of more although a more probably the other thing is that we need someone Wait, are we going to run them in parallel or in series? Are we going to run them in parallel or in series? Uh, it's going to depend on how many people sign up. This camera's way nicer than the cameras on my preceding phones. Phones get better so much faster than all the other objects in my life. That's sad. Why? I mean, all else equal, it's sad. Like, if they fix only the quality of the show, it's going better. Okay, everybody! Hey, okay, welcome to our third guest lecture. Um, this is Quixie, who I'm sure you've all heard of. Uh, Paul actually worked there, so maybe he can probably say more than I can. Cool. So first off, you may have been confused by the theme of the guest lectures. To clarify, it's like awesome things that humans do that you might not have been aware of. It seems like you will become better humans if you're aware of more awesome things that exist in the world. Okay, that's the preface. Um, Liron has co-founded Quixi, which is on track to be pretty awesome. Um, <clears throat> you should all listen to what he has to say. However, I'm going to give a caveat, which is that Liron is an awesome person, and the views he expresses may be extreme. And while I think they're important and useful things to say, they're not necessarily the views of Spark. <laughs> or the views of Spark. <laughs> <laughs> That's in other it. words, Paul's giving you carte blanche, basically. Yeah, now say whatever you want. You can be as crazy as you like and as true as you like. Uh, <laughs> Great. Anyway. Cool. Okay. Guy with the Quixie shirt, awesome. I appreciate, yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> wow. Okay. 
This is uh, actually, yeah, I'm not, I'm not used to going to random places and having people wear the shirt of my company in support of my cause, so thanks. You should visit Lindbergh High School. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. You guys have a nice thing going here, by the way. So I, uh, I just came here right now. I meant to spend most of the day here, actually, but uh, some really important stuff went down last minute at work, so I ended up coming last minute. Uh, but I know you guys have a good thing going. I was here last year actually at Spark. Uh, I met a bunch of people and I gotta tell you, it's really awesome. Like this, this camp is totally unique. Uh, I, if I remember from last year, basically everybody's, everybody here is a cooler person than I was at your age. So, feel good about that. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, so, so a little context. So full disclosure, this is a corporate sponsored talk. Uh, I think Quixie dropped like a few grand to, to enable me to give this talk, otherwise I'd have to like go chat with you individually. So full disclosure, so I made the talk about Quixie. I also like Quixie and there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff for you to hear, so it's mutually beneficial. Um, you might think this is a really corporate talk where we're just taking advantage of the fact that you guys are brilliant and have a great network and are going to give us good PR like apparently we have at Lindbrook. Um, <laughs> And that's, uh, and that's true, but, <laughs> but I feel like I have a great excuse, which is, I was a spark lo lover guy, I was a spark lover type, and I was a rationalist, uh, and I was a less wrong reader, and a, and a less wrong submitter, and the guy who did research for, uh, at, at the time it was known the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence, and I read 500 less wrong articles, and I eliminated a lot of my biases, and, and practiced applied rationality, and epistemic, and read all the quantum theory sequences, if you guys know about that. Um, I was a rationalist before I went into the real world and, and did anything applied, which is pretty sweet. It was like, the whole time I was doing the real world stuff, I was aware of all the all the background rationality stuff that, that you guys are learning here at Spark. Um, it's, I mean, I guess you guys will be like that too, right? If, if you guys go do startups and stuff. Uh, it's pretty crazy. I like to think that some of the rationality stuff has helped me. I feel a lot more intellectually honest since I learned rationality. I, I feel, I really do feel like my thinking is clear, uh, you know, like noticeably more than it was before, noticeably more than other people's. It's good stuff. Uh, that said, it certainly wasn't the only key to my success. Really, uh, having other great people around you is incredibly key, like no matter how rational you are, uh, especially my co-founder, Tomer, who's the CEO of Quixie. Uh, so it wasn't pure rationality, it was also other brilliant people. Uh, and Paul helped a lot too when he was an intern. So let's, uh, <laughs> that's right, great people in Paul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so let's, so let's get right down to it. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Quixie. Quixie started in 2009. Uh, the premise of Quixie is taking apps serious. Our motto is the search engine for apps. Um, it's, it sounds, honestly, when people think about apps, apps have a bit of a bad rap. They're these round rectangles and you click them and you use them on your phone. Right? And then you go and use real software and use the real internet. Okay, so the premise of Quixie is actually taking apps seriously. That a search engine for apps is actually a big deal. And that apps represent kind of the, the third wave of personal computing. Like we had shrink-wrapped software in the 80s and 90s, and then we had kind of the static content web. And now we've got this convergence where native software is going online and being part of the web. And the whole conception of the web is broadening to include mobile, to include lots of new devices, cars, everything interacts with everything, and maybe you don't have like an HTTP client per se, maybe you have like a native client running Objective-C, but it doesn't matter, it's one big happy web. We call it the functional web, and we think that the next type of search engine that you're going to use on a daily basis is going to be what we call a functional search that can understand native apps just as easily as it can websites, just as easily as it can any technology in the long term. Like, every piece of technology is going to go on the web, and in that day, what you're going to have is the, the long-term Quixie product to search for it all. All right, but let me start from the beginning. So I'm going to explain to you what is functional search today, right? So today it really is a search that returns apps. I'm going to explain how it works. 
And then I'm also going to talk about the future of functional search and why it's more important than the, than the traditional uh, narrow-minded view people have had about apps. Okay, what is functional search? So here's a classic example of a functional search. So you go to quixie.com today, or you go to some of our partners like ask.com, or if you buy a Sprint phone, uh, our search technology is actually distributed in a lot of places. But let's say you go to the, you go right to the source, quixie.com, uh, and you search for a nearby restaurant. I know it's hard to see. Uh, so we'll, we'll be like, okay, here's some apps that can help you find a nearby restaurant. Urban Spoon, Open Table, uh, Food Finder, Yelp. Uh, and Google Play will, will have a little more difficulty with it, like apparently it doesn't find you Yelp for some reason. Um, they didn't work hard on their, apparently they didn't work that hard on their actual app store search. They only care about their web search, as far as we can tell. Uh, so we do this for Android apps, for iPhone apps. Um, actually, I'll show you the complete list of platforms, but first here's a couple more examples. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so when in a movie to pee. So there's apps that help you do this. In particular, there's one called RunPee. If you don't know about it, this is a public service announcement. If you're watching a movie, you want to know when it's a good time to take a pee. Uh, this app will tell you, plus, when you come back, it'll tell you what you missed. <laughs> so, check it out. Uh, and the thing is, and, and you know, this just shows you that the potential of apps is so unexploited. Like, if you've ever gone to pee at the wrong time in a movie, it's like, that is a market failure. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, Google, uh, for some reason, Google Play has trouble with this. I mean, we actually methodically compare ourselves. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we actually methodically compare ourselves against a lot of search engines, but I'm just using Google Play as kind of a punching bag. Uh, okay, control my laptop, so we have like those kind of apps. All right. Uh, so we power stuff. So Quixie is not a destination site. Our, we're not going out there and be like, hey, never, every time you want an app, go to quixie.com. We don't really want to change users' behavior. And the reason is because there's so many places today that are giving crappy experiences that should be Quixie-powered and aren't. Like, you saw Google Play. I mean, with Google, it's like, okay, sure, you'd expect them to do better on Google Play. But look at all the other places where, where apps are being found, and it's kind of crappy. Like, the iTunes store, like, Apple wasn't a search company. They actually purchased one of our competitors called Chomp to help them do their app search. It's like, okay, we could have powered them, whatever. Um, there's, there's also, I mean, right, Facebook had apps at one point. They kind of stopped. Uh, you know, if you ever use Salesforce, there's like a whole app ecosystem for Salesforce, Windows Phone. Um, there, there's so many places, there's so many app ecosystems. This is just in the US. If you go to China, for example, there's actually 20 independent app stores that are all as popular as Google Play is in China. So it, the argument is, is actually a lot more relevant internationally, but it's also pretty relevant in the US. There's all these places where people have really crappy searches for apps that Quixie powers. And we've got a few different types of solutions. So like if you have, we actually do you know, straight up iTunes, Google Play, and other app stores. Uh, but we also do, we can preload a search widget. If you have an Android phone, your primary search bar can just be Quixie powered. Uh, we've got a voice activated app search. So, so stuff like that. We're actually a search backend. Uh, if you remember in the old days, this, this may be before your guys' time, but like you'd go to yahoo.com, your primary destination in the 90s, and it would be like, oh, powered by Google. So that's us, we're the, we're the powered by guys. Uh, and here's the different platforms we support. So iPhone, Android, Windows Phone, Mac PC, Firefox add-ons, Chrome extensions, i add-ons. I mean, we have this broad definition of software and apps in general. Okay, so some of the secret sauce of Quixie is we didn't tackle app search the naive way. We didn't just go into the app store and download everybody's catalog descriptions and then search the text of the description, right? That's like the most naive app search approach ever. We're actually like, hey, what if actually, uh, what if you want to simulate an intelligent human who's helping you find apps? If I'm your friend and I want to help you find apps, I'd be like, oh, well, let me go on the internet and let me read some third-party reviews and let me go, go to different catalogs and see what they have to say about the apps and see the different ways the apps are classified and let me look at these popularity sites to see how the apps are trending and let me analyze some sentiment on Twitter and let's get some third-party data about battery life. Basically, all of these things are signals that a rational Bayesian would update their belief about whether the, the app is good for you on. And we don't want to ignore information as a search engine. We want to consider every relevant piece of information. So, so that's the idea. And you can see we treat the app as what we call a first order object. So naively, people will go to the, the iTunes store catalog and they'll be like, oh, here's two different apps. Uh, Shazam Premium Edition, or like some, you know, Angry Birds Premium and Angry Birds Free, two completely different apps. It's like, no, it's obviously just Angry Birds where one of them you have to pay and, and you get more functionality. Like it's obviously the same core product, uh, but you're just getting a different what we call an edition of it. Uh, and even if you go to the Android market or the Google Chrome App Store or whatever and you see Angry Birds there, 
It's like, okay, it's the same app. Right, so one of the first things we did is we, we did what, what uh, rationalists call modeling the mapping the territory. We wanted to make sure that our map looks like a developer developing an app that they want a user to use. And all these other details like platform, edition, device are actually secondary. Um, the traditional way people think about app searches are like, oh yeah, you gotta pick your platform uh, and then you gotta, you gotta pick all your device requirements and then you can see a list of apps for your platform. It's ignoring the obvious, really powerful market dynamic that developers are trying to make apps for users to use. That's the central dynamic and that's central for a model. All right, how it works. So let me show you the straw man, how to build a search engine for dummies. This is what um, pe people's first guess is as, as to what we do. Um, they're like, yep, all you do is you just get some search tool like Lucene and you make a set of search documents and you index them and then you just get them ranked by text and popularity. Okay, but that doesn't really work. So for example, imagine the query is, uh, is phone, internet phone calls. So you can have app number one, scammer internet phone calls, and the description is internet phone calls, internet phone calls, internet phone calls. And the review is, this app sucks, you can't make phone calls on the internet. Um, and it only has 50 downloads. But hey, it, it's, it's technically more, uh, a naive metric called TFIDF thinks that the text of this app is more relevant than the text of Skype. Um, so. So you can't just throw it into a naive text matching algorithm. So then the next guess is like, okay, well you just consider the popularity and then you just show higher popularity apps first. Okay, that doesn't quite work either. And, and now it gets more subtle. So imagine the query is coffee shop. Uh, so you have this app called Coffee Cafe, which is a game. The title doesn't have game in it, it's, just, it's a game. Um, and the description is, as the barista of your own coffee house, keep your customers happy by serving them their order combinations. Uh, okay, so that, that actually seems pretty relevant. Like be your own barista, that seems pretty relevant to Coffee Shop. Um, and the review says Coffee Shop in it, and it has 500,000 downloads and four stars. And then you have this other app, Coffee Anywhere, that's talking about finding coffee shops. So maybe it's about equal in terms of naive text relevance. And actually it has a lot fewer downloads, and the rating is a little less. But the thing is that if somebody actually types Coffee Shop in the, the search bar, they probably don't want to play a, a game where they run a coffee shop, even if it does have 500,000 downloads. I mean, maybe they do, but it's somewhat more likely that they actually want to go, uh, you know, find a nearby coffee shop. So this is why you actually need uh, a bunch of, if you keep going down this rabbit hole where I keep showing you these edge cases, eventually you're like, damn, there's a lot of edge cases. It's almost like this is a many dimensional problem and there's not like a simple, you know, there's no low dimensional structure to the problem. And that's why we're gonna bust out some fancy machine learning uh, so we can model this like large, multi-dimensional, complex relationship between many factors. <coughs> All right, so here's, uh, here's more setup of why the problem is hard. Uh, so we got all this variable low quality data. Like if you just try to mine a bunch of text, there's like a bunch of crap in it. That's actually a really big problem. Uh, right, like somebody might write new in version two. That's like, that's my description or something. We get that a lot. Uh, app stores have little quality control, so like there's 20, 2,424 apps with Facebook in the title uh, in our database, so you know those can be a pain to sift through. Uh, oh, merging is, is a really big deal for us, right? So it's this concept of we treat apps as first order objects. We know that the 30 versions of Angry Birds are actually ultimately the same app, just kind of distributed in, in different ways. We know that, but it gets really fuzzy. So for example, like Angry Birds Star Wars came out, Angry Birds face, it's like, come on, there's no gravity, is that really Angry Birds? <laughs> it, starts to, it starts to get borderline, and there's things like, sometimes you'll have like, oh, it's a trivia game, uh, but, this, but it's a trivia game by the same manufacturer that's about sports instead of being about, uh, I don't know, sports or uh, politics, whatever. Um, so it's like, are those the same app? It's, it's kind of fuzzy. Uh, so, and the answer is just, you know, we keep iterating on it. We just have all these heuristics, and we have these, uh, we have independent contractors come in and test the system and give it like a one-dimensional score and we try to maximize the score. That's the life of a uh, you know, search engine company. Okay, um, relevance is more than just keywords. Uh, there's, there's all these different signals that come into the system. Uh, different queries have different types of intents. So sometimes a user will write something because they want to play a game, like in our example before, and sometimes they want to like go do a local search and, and get an app to help them like navigate nearby. There's all these different types of intents. Uh, app names are sometimes helpful and sometimes not. 
So if the name of the app, if you've never heard of Skype before or this or this to-do list app, if you've never heard of any dot do this to-do list app, then the title is pretty damn useless. I mean, I guess the word do is kind of relevant, but like it gets crazy. Uh, so titles of popular apps are, are pretty crap. Like if you've never heard of Yelp before, chances are your query is not gonna have the word Yelp in it when you want local businesses. Uh, but at the same time, the title is really relevant when it comes to like medium popularity apps. Like if you want, if you want like Caltrain schedules, that's the that's the type of query where actually Caltrain in the title would be incredibly relevant. So all these factors. Anyway, so here's our basic approach. It's machine learned regression search. This is a nice generalized <coughs> approach. Um, this approach crosses the mind of any company that wants to kick it up a notch with search. Right, so if you don't want to kick it up a notch, you just get like a Lucene index that matches your keywords for you. And if you do want to kick it up a notch, then you consider uh, this machine learning regression approach. Uh, our goal is to learn how, uh, how to map a pair of a query in an app, how to map that to a score. So for example, if the query is throw a bird at a pig and the app is angry birds, that should get like a really high score, like 0.99 on a scale of zero to one. Um, so, right, so that's, that's our goal. Um, but we can't get there directly because the actual mapping contains like the entire, you know, human preferences, the structure of human preferences in that mapping ultimately, right? Um, so, so what we try to do is we, we map the query app pair to this proxy, this feature vector of maybe a hundred or so features that just say random stuff like, oh, how many words in the query? What is like the Twitter sentiment about the app? How many words do the query and the app have in common? All these different what we call features. And then hopefully we can machine learn the relationship between these numerical features in the score. Uh, because that's like within the realm of, of algorithmic possibility. Okay, so so we define a bunch of features, and then we collect training points, right? So ultimately, we need to, it's a supervised learning approach. We need to train the machine learner. In order to train the machine learner, we need uh, like tens of thousands of actual humans who come in um, and they and they look at a query and they look at a bunch of apps that are that our system attempts to guess maybe they're good, maybe they're not. And a human has to come in and be like, yes, Angry Birds is a great result for the query throw birds at pig pigs. So we have, it's it's this really, you know, tedious approach. I mean it's tedious. You need to pay out a lot of money. Uh, one time Paul tried to make a system where we do it with mechanical Turk, but it's a little messy, even with dedicated full time uh, kind of test with training employees, it's still a pain, so Mechanical Turk was even more of a pain, especially in a couple of weeks like we tried to do it. Um, so anyway, we collect a ton of training points, and then we train the machine learning regression model to try to learn the relationship between the feature vectors and the scores. Because once we have that, then we're golden, right? Because then the next time we get a query app pair, we'll map it to the feature vector, and we'll, we'll know a regression model to map the feature vector to the score, and then we'll have our query app to score mapping. Okay, any questions so far? I don't know. I, I feel like you guys are like so smart that this is trivial. Yeah, okay. Yep, so here's like types of features, like word count, popularity. Uh, there's three, uh, three categories of features. So there's query features, features that are just features of the query, and then there's features that are just features of the app, and then there's features that, are, that you need both the query and the app to calculate the features. And these are the most expensive to calculate because you can only calculate them once you know what the query and the app is, which only happens at search time unless you like, try to predict in advance. Uh, so like TF-IDF, that's uh, text frequency, inverse document frequency. It's a fancy way to be like, how many words in common does the query have with the app? Especially if the words are rare, that's worth more. That's what TF-IDF means. Um, and like, okay, category alignment. So for example, maybe the query, maybe we classify that anytime you're talking about shooting, there's like a good chance you're in a gaming mode. So even if the app is like slay zombies and it doesn't explicitly mention shooting, well, they're both categorical. Like the query hit the category, um, you know, like aggressive ga action games and the, and the result hit the category action games. So there is a, what we call a query result feature, category alignment. So stuff like that, we just calculate a ton of features. We get our big vector. Uh, okay, but it's kind of hard. Let's talk about meta features. It's kind of hard to actually have 100 features and calculate a mapping between 100 dimensional feature vectors and one dimensional scores. Um, I mean, 100 dimensional space is a big space, right? And if somebody comes in and gives us, let's say, 10,000 training points of, uh, of mapping query app pairs to scores, we have 10,000 of those training points. Uh, that's 10,000 points trying to constrain um, like a graph in 100 one dimensional space. Right? And it, it turns out that's like not that many. So what happens is we have these experts, these guys who are experts at machine learning. I'm not one, but they basically do a bunch of voodoo tweaking the parameters of the algorithm that creates the regression model. They tweak the parameters to try to like do a 101 dimensional thing 
uh, to try to make a hundred one-dimensional graph anyway out of the out of out of the mere ten thousand training points. But they have some good hacks. So one of them is called native features, uh, and this reduces the dimensionality that we have to learn the regression model on. Uh, so instead of learning a hundred-dimensional uh, feature vector for score mapping, what we do is like maybe we'll group ten features together, and then we'll uh, we'll define a meta feature which represents you know some function of ten features, uh, and then later we only have to learn a machine learned model of ten meta features. So that seems like a nice cheat. I mean, obviously it has pros and cons. So are you still optimizing jointly, or are you somehow like? doing the meta feature mappings like independently and then combining it? It's, it's like independent from a Bayesian screening off sense. So like in this diagram, uh, we have like this meta feature called quality that totally screens off number of tweets from overall score and number of tweets is like combined with other stuff like number of positive reviews. But my like impression is that... When you're learning the dependence of quality on number of tweets. Yeah. yeah. So like the 101 dimensional map that you're learning is basically like what's inside of the arrows, right? Uh, what's inside of the arrows? Like, those those arrows represent some, like, relationship between number of tweets and quality. Right. And, like, when you say you're, like, learning a model, you mean, like, you're learning what, like, the actual, like, numerical relationship is that that arrow represents, right? Um, I think this might be a little misleading. So, uh, there's actually, imagine 10, 10 of these circles here. All sure. Right here. Uh, and, and we can either do two things. The easiest thing we can do is just manually like average them or something, right? Just manually define how these propagate into this node. Um, and then if we want to get fancy, we could be like, okay, crap, this is actually its own complicated subproblem, and then machine learn this, and separately machine learn this together with these guys affecting this. Okay. Yeah. And do you so, get supervised data for each of the? Yeah. So we've actually done that before. We've done like separate machine learning runs, uh, complete with supervised data on mere meta features. So like we brought a bunch of people in to be like, okay, tell me how textually relevant this excerpt is, and we would train like a textual relevance learner on that, and that would just be a meta feature that feeds into the larger uh, overall score. Yep. So so the idea is like we as a human know that uh, some features practically screen off other features from each other, and we can use that to. Uh, that way we can make it so that the machine learning algorithm, if we tried to do 100 dimensional machine learning, it would go down, it would go down a bunch of like fall, blind alleys because it doesn't realize that we can, you know, we can know that stuff is independent thanks to our human insight. Thanks to our human insight, we know that uh, number of tweets and sentiment together, um, if you know like the average of number of tweets and, and number of some other thing, quality thing, that screens off, um, you know, that screens off the effect of, uh, of like a textual thing. I don't know, I mean this diagram explains it. Um, so yes, yeah, so the pro, the con is that it constrains what I can learn. So like if there's some crazy relationship between specifically number of tweets and some text thing, um, then you're not gonna learn it because you've um, you know, screened it off by factoring it into quality. Um, but hey, you know, if, if, if there is an anticipated relationship, just don't make a meta feature out of it. Okay, yeah, so that's the pro. So we have this domain knowledge as humans. Don't make the 100-dimensional machine learning figure it out. It's also easier to get high-quality test data. Yeah, so, so sometimes our testers have a problem uh, with this idea of like, hey, give me the overall best score. Like, just how happy does it make you? Right? Sometimes it's kind of hard to even get precise test data on, on what does um, what a higher-quality result mean. So if we just ask them more specific questions, um, at least we can get precise meta feature scores. <clears throat> okay, and then we uh, so we collect evaluation points. So the idea is, as we keep iterating on our search, we need a number that says how good is the search right now, and we need to see the number going up as we keep doing fancy stuff. Um, so there's this thing called DCG, uh, dis discounted cumulative gain. There's this formula where you take a ranked list of search results and you compare it against the theoretically best possible ranked list of search results. Uh, and you get a single number telling you, like, uh, how good is my search relative to the best possible search. Why would you do that as opposed to just, like, asking for what the best list would be? Oh, like asking a tester what the best list would be? Well... It's like, I want to see, yeah, I, yeah. I just wrote down the exact same question on my phone, just that. Sure, so the, I think the, the answer there is that if a tester just comes in, like, the testers are just, like, random people off the street. I can't be like, hey, write down the ten best lists of internet phone calls. They're like, uh, I've, I don't really know, I'm not really an expert at the internet phone call space. I see, well, like, how are they generating the number, then? 
oh, how does the tester end work? Yeah. So the tester actually goes and explores all the different data we have about the app, like clicks through to the whole page we have, like here's the description. Um, you know, it's, if, they're, if they're confused, they're supposed to actually download and use the app, but of course that's like really expensive to do, so we kind of discourage it for the most part, but they could. Um, it's a lot easier to, to be faced with an app and a query and be like, okay, do a little bit of research using the data in front of you and tell me how good this is. But that's a lot easier than be like, hey, go independently search um, you know, a bunch of other sources and compile the list of the 10 best. So you're only asking them one app and one query. At a time, yeah. At a time. So it's not like you're like, here's the like 10 top responses for this query, tell me how good this list is. It's like, tell me how good this particular app is as a response to this query. That's right. So one, one thing that's important to point out is it's the whole search system is kind of iterative. So I'll, I'll walk you through from the beginning. So it starts with so it starts with the system we have today. And the very first system we had that we bootstrapped didn't even have machine learning. It just had our own, like, hey, why don't you add some constant, you know, linear combination of quality and relevance. That was like the, the early system. So you take the previous system that you have and you use it for any given test query. You use it to, to generate 10 candidate results. Uh, and then ideally the 10 candidate results would be ranked like, oh, this is a five out of five, this is a five out of five, this is a four out of five, this is a three out of five. Right? But realistically, when you show it to testers, they're going to be like, oh, the first result sucks, that's a 2 out of 5, and the next one's a 5 out of 5, and the next one's like a 1 out of 5. Uh, so that's the whole point, is you show your, best, your, your previous system's best guess to testers, then they give you a bunch of new rankings for various app query pairs, uh, and, and kind of disagree with the way that your system ordered it, and then hopefully your next system will order it better. All right, what kind of regression model do we use? So I talked about the 100-dimensional learning problem. We totally cheat and reduce it to like a 10-dimensional learning problem, and we try to use as few training points as possible, you know, to save money. Um, okay, but that still leaves the question of like, what kind of model do we learn, right? Like, is it, uh, is it like a, a you know, linear separator, or, uh, you know, the, there's lots of different kind of models. Like I said, I'm not the machine learning guy, uh, but we, we use a, a boosted, boosted decision tree for search ranking, and, and we didn't even write the, the hardcore machine learning algorithms, because our core competency isn't machine learning per se, it's using machine learner to accomplish the larger, larger task of app search. Okay, so we have this subsystem called TreeNet, um, and uh, when we train the model, uh, we train it to, in order to minimize mean squared error along all our training points. Right, so the idea is like, we have these points, uh, we have these query comma, uh, I mean we have these 100 dimensional feature vector comma score you're supposed to give this training points. So we have a bunch of those. And it would be great to best fit, uh, you know, like an 11 dimensional or 100 to 1 dimensional. It would be great to best fit this learn curve to like get really close to those training points. Uh, and then we have like a metric for that. Uh, here's the formula for DCG. Let's see. Okay, so this process, I don't want to overstate this process like it's this elegant, theoretically elegant thing. It's always a giant mess. It's a giant mess and it's like, and you really do need an expert to successfully tweak the parameters. And like you guys are probably qualified to like go be one of those experts as, as your career if you're into that kind of thing. Um, so like the kind of things experts do is they'll run a model and they'll be like, hmm, I wonder if I just eliminate these features, it might simplify life for, for the training model. Like that happens sometimes, although TreeNet is actually a smart package, it's supposed to figure that out for itself. But they also do things like, hey, I wonder if, if I wonder if I instead of this like continuous variable I have, what if I actually lump this variable into, into discrete buckets, and then maybe the machine learner will be able to, uh, to, to will be able to be more productive if I use some judgment into, you know, putting this range of values and turning this continuous variable into a discrete variable, stuff like that. That is the life of a machine learning expert. All right, so yeah, that's flux or something. Something weird happened to you. Uh, I don't have flex, so it's probably just uh, in place layer. I don't know, it seems okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so everything I've said so far is about the what we call the Quixie A system, kind of the product that we've gone to market with, uh, which is a product that you send Quixie a search query parameterized by platform, maybe a price filter, and we're like, okay, here's your rank list of apps. Go download and use them on your on your platform of choice. Right? That's that's the Quixie system we have today. Uh, but the Quixie vision really generalizes from that in a way that I think is profound. Uh, it's, it's the whole functional web thing I'm going to tell you about. All right, so today if you read the news, 
uh, people talk as if there's this dichotomy between apps and the web. Like, oh, do you want to use an app or do you want to use the web? And I see all these graphs in the press like, oh, apps, app share is gaining on web share. Like 60% of people's time on mobile is now spent inside apps. Okay, I see stuff like that. And, and whenever I see that, I'm like, who cares? It's all the same thing. It's all just clients on the functional web. So for example, like, you know, I've used the Domino's app before. I like a good pizza. Okay, but I've also used the Domino's website. And it's essentially the exact same functionality. And chances are it's run by the exact same servers in, in, inside Domino's you know, hosting rack. Uh, so it's kind of disingenuous to portray the app as like a, such a competitor to the web. Or like Zappos, here's like the exact same pair of Ugg boots on, you know, served up through the, the Zappos app and served up through the HTML5 Zappos website, and again, it's like the same boots, you know it's coming from like the same database query, you know a lot, there's like an internal service layer uh, that's serving it up into the internal front end layer. Um, okay, so the big innovation here, let me zoom out a little bit, let me get real general and talk about wants and technology. Okay, so you have a lot of wants, like maybe you want to have a clean house, and we have a lot of different technology. Technology gets us what we want. So. Uh, you can map a broom or a mop or a vacuum cleaner. All these technologies map to serving the want of having a clean house. Uh, and you can see a, a subset of wants I've labeled functions. So I want to define a function as a technologically feasible want. Right? So today going to Mars isn't quite a function of present day technology. Going to Mars is like right here, but one day you know, this thing is going to get a little bigger and then going to Mars is going to be a function and not just a mere want. So that's, that's my distinction here between wants and technology. Uh, so my point about the functional web is that but my point about the functional web is that analogous to having a broom and a mop and a vacuum cleaner to clean your house, you've also got you know the Yelp website and the Yelp app on Windows Phone and the Yelp app on iPhone. You've got all these versions of Yelp uh, in order to get you this task of of listing nearby karaoke places, right? And the technology is powering that. It could be a web server or a piece of JavaScript, what I call the technological web. Uh, or it could just be a native app, right? So, so again, this is like your broom, this is like your mop, right? That's, that's, the, that's the big picture here. So what is the functional web? The functional web is actually a technical concept. We realized like, wait a minute, the interesting stuff here isn't actually technological details. And the way I know that is because the technological details of websites have changed a lot. If you were around, uh, if you were using the web in the early 90s, when, when the web was you know, first invented, uh, when you would hit up a URL and you'd get this function of 